a short introduction of myself. Um, I'm Jaap. Um, I'm the co-founder of Gogo, which is a content library for professional services uh, firms. Um, I'm on Twitter, GitHub, so if you're interested, you can find me there. Um, so basically, um, before I started um, Kogo, I worked as a data scientist. I don't really have a background into computer science, so sometimes I don't really know the, you know, the algorithms and stuff, so <laughs> forgive me for that. Um, so um, my talk is actually going to be about uh, data loading. Um, and specifically, this, uh, this is a, a problem you probably run into if you use GraphQL. Um, so this is something I've kind of been have been on my mind for, for some time, um, and uh, I've been thinking about it. And um, uh, so, so there was not really a great solution for this in Elixir. Um, and, 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 and this is kind of the topic of my uh, talk. So actually, um, it's not specifically related to GraphQL. If you use other um, mechanisms to load data, you have the same issues probably. But uh, if you use GraphQL, you run into it. Uh, pretty quickly. So, who in this uh, room has uh, heard of GraphQL? A lot of people, that's good. And how many people actually used it before? In, uh, okay, yeah. So I don't really need to explain a lot about, about GraphQL, but uh, I can, you know, this is like a typical query uh, of GraphQL. Um, so basically you say, I'm looking for a profile. From this profile, I uh, want the name. Uh, I also want the name of the best friend of this person. And for, for the first five friends, I want the name uh, and also the best friend name. So this is quite nested, right? Um, so uh, one of the, so if you would run this, you'll get this. Um, it's basically a big, big map and GraphQL would kind of uh, fill in the things you, you would, would be looking for. So the, the, the query would be, uh, you would run the query in your app, you say, okay, this is the data I want, and they would get back from the GraphQL server the data. Um, so here you see kind of like, okay, I get back a name, I get back the name of a best friend, and then I have a list of friends with the same information. So um, the, the, the problem here is that um, you run into the n plus one problem. And in this case, because you're looking for the list of friends, uh, if you would run a query for each friend, uh, you basically uh, reach out to the database for each friend. And for a small list, that's not a problem, but if you're working with longer lists, and if you work with deeper nesting, uh, that, that's going to be a problem. Because basically, uh, there's quite a lot of overhead for like sending a, a query to the database. And then you also have the waterfall effect. So you kind of wait uh, for the first friend to arrive, and then you query the next friend, right? So it's um, for more complex queries, this, this would be pretty slow, uh, and you, this will actually be noticeable. And on the other side, you're also overloading the database. So um, if you scale your service, you're basically hammering the database with a lot of queries. So this will actually really be a problem. Um, and you see if you get com more complex queries, it actually will get exponentially slower. I'm not quadrat quadratically for, you know, depending on the list, and then if you nest deeper, it will uh, have, uh, have this impact. Um, so if we, so let's forget about the GraphQL query. If we would write this into Elixir code, we might have this context, and uh, it's like where the business logic is. And we might have a function uh, where we get a user, um, and we basically say to the database, get this user, and then we have another function to get the friends IDs of a particular user, Again, you reach out to the database. Okay, these are the friends. Uh, th these are, this is the user ID. I want to get all the IDs of the friends. Um, and the database can be, can be basically anything that is not really uh, important. It can be like Ecto or like SQL or whatever. This problem, it's like, uh, it's the same for each database. So then if we kind of um, load a user and a best friend, you know, this, uh, this function can look like this. So basically, you say to the user's context, get this ID, uh, th this user, with this, uh, this idea, I get back a user. And for the best friend, uh, I get my best friend idea and send it to uh, 
the user's context to get back the best friend. Um, the result I will put in the map, uh, as you can see. Um, and then to get the full uh, data set that I requested with the query, uh, this is a function load profile. It basically loads uh, me as a user. It will request the friend's IDs again, and then a map over the friend IDs and load the same function uh, uh, for, for those friends. And then the last step is combining those two results in a, in a single map. And, uh, and so this will get the same result as the, the query. So this is kind of written out uh, in the Elixir code, uh, how does th that, that will work. So again, uh, if we do the first query, I get uh, myself, my best friend, as a query. So this is kind of the, the right side is a database log. So I logged out what the database will, uh, will do. Um, so it will get user one, get user three. This is still fine. Then I ask for all the friends' IDs. So it will do another query for the friend IDs. That's fine. But then if I do this, I get all these uh, like 10 uh, requests uh, to the database. And this is like the n plus one problem again. Um, so um, there are a few uh, different ways how we can optimize this. Uh, the most important one is, uh, is batching. Um, so if we, um, f for the long list of friends, I would probably want to send a single query uh, to the database and say, okay, I want all these users. So this is like the most important thing. If you do this, uh, you're probably good. Uh, there's a few other things you can do as well. So caching, uh, so as you can see in this list, uh, the fourth uh, request, is uh, again user three, but we already requested that as a second request uh, to the database. So, uh, so if we apply caching, we can basically uh, not do that uh, because we already have it. Um, and there's a few other uh, uh, double uh, requests there as well. Uh, and another uh, thing you can do is do some things in parallel that are not dependent on each other. Uh, and that's also, you know, you don't have the waterfall uh, you may have need to do two requests to the database, but they can happen at, at the same time. So, um, so that will also make the response quicker. Um, so, of course, <laughs> if you use Elixir, um, AppSynth is the, the most uh, popular uh, GraphQL server. There's another one as well, but I think AppSynth is uh, having the most traction within the Elixir community. And uh, they created a data loader. A uh, data loader was uh, created by uh, Facebook, and they kind of uh, released a few f different versions of data loader in different languages. Um, and the AppSynth project created a version for Elixir. How this works is basically you declare your data needs. So you basically say, I want, uh, you know, I want all these users. Then explicitly you run the data loader, and then it will fetch uh, it's all in one go and we'll apply batching, caching, and everything like that. Um, and then you can get the data back from the result. Um, so this is the way how, how you can solve it. Uh, this is how it works in code. So you basically get the loader, you load, and here I load uh, user one, user two. Then I explicitly run the loader and then I get it back from the result, which is like a data structure that contains the results. Um, so how does this work in your GraphQL uh, layer? So each resolver, and resolvers are kind of like uh, controllers. If you're familiar with um, uh, model view control controller, uh, the resolver, the job is to you know, fetch, for instance, a user. Um, and those resolvers will get a data loader. What I then can do in a, in a resolver is basically load the data and supply a callback. Um, and then the middleware uh, combines all of that together, uh, runs the data loader one time, and then all the callbacks are being run after that. Right? So this is how it looks like. There is a shorthand, but if you do it explicitly, this is how you do it. Um, so in your resolver, you have the loader, you load the thing you want to load, and you supply a callback on load. And the uh, callback internally within AppSynth, uh, it just returns a, tu a tuple. 
um, where it says, okay, middleware, you have to, you have to solve this. Um, and then it uh, kind of combines all the data loaders and runs the, uh, the callbacks. Um, right, so problem solved, right? We don't have the M plus one problem. We efficiently query data. Uh, yeah, this, this problem is solved. So in my opinion, uh, I wasn't really happy with this. And the most important reason was uh, because of uh, the single responsibility principle. So what happens if you do this? You kind of uh, do the data loading in your resolver. And so um, the resolver should basically just be responsible to call out to the context, um, in my opinion. And uh, that's also uh, like the, the, the creators at Facebook, they said, OK, keep your GraphQL layer as uh, thin as possible and do all your business logic in a different uh, module. Um, so that, that was something not optimal. Um, the, the also another point is that um, if you do this in your resolvers, only your GraphQL, GraphQL API will like, um, have the benefit of efficient data loading. And then if you do like a REST API or a different API or like an integration with Slack, it will not, uh, you know, the data will not be loaded efficiently and you have to do the, the same thing again for that particular use case. Um, and another problem, and I think that was for us a really important one, is that you might need some extra data that GraphQL doesn't really show, um, but it's important for you to, for instance, de determine if I load a profile, I might need some extra data to determine if you actually can see that profile. So we might actually want to check if we're friends and otherwise, it's like you cannot, you cannot see this. So that's another uh, data um, point you need to get from the database. Um, and so um, that's pretty hard if you do all of this in your resolver. Um, so how do other implementations uh, solve this? So um, there's a very popular data loader, loader in uh, Node.js. And uh, that um, uses promises. And uh, they have actually a way to actually use the data loader in your business logic. Because if you reach out to the data loader, uh, it works with a promise. So um, uh, every time you loop over something or you call it multiple times, it kind of waits for the next tick before it does anything. And then the da data loader internally patches everything uh, that happens at the same time. Um, so that's actually really nice. Um, <laughs> that, that will solve a problem. Um, however, like if you look at Elixir, we, we don't really have that. We don't really have an event loop. We don't really have uh, ticks or the concept of ticks. So um, processes are really truly uh, concurrent and they're isolated. So you know, how, how would you do this? Um, so if I would use a data loader in, for instance, getting a user, it kind of eagerly uh, executes. And uh, if I get a bunch of users, they will not be batched together because uh, it will do the query in that function. Uh, so my first idea was uh, like setting up a gen server. Uh, kind of you send a message to the gen server. You say, OK, I want to load this. Uh, and uh, if anything, uh, any process at the same time also reaches out to the gen server, um, the gen server can combine like um, uh, it in a single query. There's, however, like a few downsides to this. Uh, so it will only uh, work. So it kind of blocks the, the execution for the, for the process you're in. So if, if you're not paralyzing uh, in terms of uh, if you're looping over something, and you're not doing a parallel loop, um, then it will block the whole process. Um, and so then it, it will not do batching. It will basically wait until the, 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 the data loader comes back with the result until it goes to the next one. Uh, so that's actually a problem. Um, and we also kind of have to, you know, we, 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 we have to wait a certain amount because how do we determine that the first uh, message has come in and the last message with uh, Request for data comes uh, has finished uh, arriving. Uh, there's not like ticks or anything like that uh, to kind of 
batch them all together. Uh, so we kind of have to wait a certain amount. So maybe there's actually a way to do this. But uh, in my uh, experience, uh, this is, uh, this, uh, these are some downsides to this approach. Uh, there's also another um, way to do this. Like I, uh, I thought a bit, and uh, another way to do this is using the deferral pattern. So um, it's, it's kind of like a promise. A deferable and a promise are quite similar. Uh, but a deferable, you have to actively uh, run or like trigger. Um, the, the downside of this is that it's not a, like an official Elixir language feature. Um, so it doesn't exist yet. So that this is something you kind of need to implement. Uh, but like the upside of it is that it's uh, lazy. It's like a lazy data structure. It's non-blocking. You can basically loop over, uh, call it multiple times. Um, and there's no delay uh, uh, that, 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 that you need to have. Um, so um, the, the, the good side is that you can at the very end, and this is really good for GraphQL, that for instance, you know exactly what's being requested. So you know the entire query. Only then you can resolve it and kind of uh, load all the data as efficiently as possible. Um, um, yeah. I want to work with the uh, different example that you gave. Yeah, so I will uh, kind of go through that okay. uh, quite, uh, quite detailed. So it will be later in the, mm -hmm. yeah, so let's see if I can answer the question then. Um, so yeah, so the deferable protocol, um, you basically describe the requirements and this is really into the implementation. So that's not in the protocol, it's not described how you do this. Uh, that this can be anything. Uh, it's kind of the deferable protocol itself. You can kind of see it as like enumerable. So it needs uh, it needs another module that implements a protocol. But what's uh, included is that you always have a then callback. So you say, okay, I need this. After this, I want to do this. So you have a then callback, uh, and the then callback can also come back with uh, deferable again, right? So. Uh, you can have a deferred value that resolves into another defer deferred value or a list of deferred values. Um, and, an, and as I said before, you actively have to, have to trigger it. So if you have a deferred value, uh, it doesn't do anything yet. It doesn't query the database yet. But when you run uh, defer.run, it will kind of do everything. And then it uh, comes back with the real result. Is this something that you came up with? Yeah, yeah. So I had to, I had to create this. I wasn't aware of... I kind of looked for something like this in the Elixir um, uh, hex, like the package uh, system, or I didn't really look at Erlang. There might be something in Erlang, but there was nothing in Elixir, as far as I know. Um, so if we go back to the data loader, this example of how the data loader works, uh, on the left, so we basically load user one, load user two, run the data loader, and get back user one and user two using get, and put them in a map. So on the right, you can see how that works with uh, the lazy example. So we basically create a deferable where we get user one and get user two. And then we supply a defer.then callback. And that callback will only run uh, when these are resolved. And then I get back like the two uh, users. So then uh, if I really want the real result, so if I call get users, get users, it will be a deferred value, it will be a data structure. I cannot do anything with it yet. If I trigger like a defer.run on this value, I need to supply the data loader as well. That's like a, a thing I need to set up. Um, it, will, uh, it will resolve into two, a list of two users. Uh, so, so to go back to this, this actually self solves our problem because uh, we can actually put this in our context. And uh, it's kind of, you have a context that can optionally get back deferred values. Um, but we don't need, uh, yeah, kind of, we, we can call this multiple times and only and combine everything and then run the data loader and efficiently load all the data. So this kind of solves the, the, the problem, uh, but it's not like the best uh, developer experience, right? Um, uh, in my opinion, like if you have a lot of callbacks in your code, it makes it quite uh, unreadable. Uh, like if you ever use Node.js, you kind of 
have the callback hell <laughs> of like a lot of nested callbacks. Um, and uh, like in the Node.js world, they came up with uh, async await. Um, it would be really nice if we can have the same syntax as async await, but then actually for the variables. Um, so to have an example, if we would have did this, right? So we kind of say, this is a deferred function. Uh, so with the defer keyword, um, then uh, we, the two users here, we await them here, and then only the next line will be executed uh, when this comes back. Uh, so then we can put them in the in the map, and then this will look really similar to if you would just like talk to the database and get the two users. Um, and uh, you know, if you would have this, and you would have uh, run the the data loader in your GraphQL layer automatically. So if your GraphQL lo la loader knows how to uh, handle deferred values, you know, you might not even need this. Uh, so you just have this code. But well, <laughs> we need to add a language feature. Uh, that uh, sounds like it's pretty tricky. Um, so I was thinking about this. I kind of came up with the API async await. I didn't really know how to you know, do this. And I was like, oh, maybe we have to propose this uh, to the Elixir language. And you know, maybe they will uh, edit. Um, if, if we are successful, maybe they don't think it's necessary. Um, so I was thinking about this. And I was like, well, 80% of Elixir is written using Elixir. And we have uh, macros, right? So um, I was like, maybe this is actually possible to do using macros. I wasn't sure. So um, I, uh, I played around a bit. And actually, <laughs> it turns out you can do this. Um, so um, the defer package, uh, it kind of brings the deferable uh, protocol to Elixir. And it includes the defer and await uh, statements. Um, so this is. Uh, uh, something you can actually get from uh, Hex right now. Um, you need to combine this with an implementation, so the defer package itself will not be very useful. Um, it's also quite a, actually quite a simple library. That's, uh, the, the macros are really powerful, actually. Uh, it's, it's not trivial, uh, but it's also not like uh, you need to do a lot of work to, to get this. Um, and actually, the protocol is really, really simple. Uh, like most of the package itself is like doing these macro transformations to be able to have this syntax. Uh, and so lazy loader is the the first like uh, um, use of this uh, this deferable um, protocol. It kind of uh, uses the original data loader and kind of implements the the protocol. And it's the same as I just uh, showed. Uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's also quite uh, simple because I didn't do a whole implementation of a data loader. I could just use the existing uh, data loader and build it on top of that. Uh, so if you go back to our first example, um, so the, the context you know, I, I showed before where we have like the users, uh, we have a get function and a get friend IDs function. Uh, how to do this with this new uh, uh, defer deferable um, lazy loader. Um, so basically, you kind of, in the get function, you basically have to uh, run uh, lazy loader dot get. And uh, uh, you basically, th this is the same way as how I showed you the normal data loader works, except we don't have to run load and get. So you just have to do get. Um, and then for get friend ideas, uh, it works the same way. You call the lazy loader. You say, OK, I want to get the friend IDs for this user. So actually, as you can see, it's very similar to just using uh, the database directly. Um, so we have to run, we have to kind of write a source for the data loader. Uh, if you're using Ecto, that's already there, so you don't have to write anything new. Uh, the database is like an uh, example database. And I wrote a very, I wrote it on top of the key value source, which is like a very simple key value uh, um, uh, data store. So um, if we go back again to the load user and load profile and see how this works with deferrables, 
it's also very similar to the simple case, to the na naive case where we have the, the problem with data loading. So um, again, uh, I'll get, uh, you get the user and it kind of awaits, lays you, the call, you call the context and you await the result. Uh, then for best friend, you also uh, call lazy, lazy users of get and await it. Then you kind of create the, the map that includes you and the best friend. Um, and for the whole profile, we kind of call this uh, lazy load user, await it, then it getting the friends ideas. So we call again the lazy users um, context, get the friend ideas, await it, result. So we get back the friend ideas. And then we uh, map over the friend ideas um, um, and, and get run again the lazy load users uh, function. Um, the last line is exactly the same, combines the two maps. Um, so as you can see, you know, this code looks really similar to the co how you would, uh, how the code would look like uh, if you would just um, write it on like calling a normal uh, database. So, um, so that's actually uh, really nice. Um, so if we compare it to different uh, implementations, so um, we would query the name of the first uh, user. This is uh, quite similar. Uh, then we uh, query the name of the best friend. Still the same, that's fine. Uh, then we get the friend ideas. And here it is a different. Like here it will, in this case, query five different users. In a new implementation, it will only query uh, four users. And like the data loader automatically also has caching. So it gets back only, or it only asks for four users. And then uh, if we query the best friends, uh, again, there's some duplication. So we only need to ask for three different uh, users here. So the code looks very similar, but we, we get um, uh, efficient data loading for free. Um, so the conclusion of this is that, um, you know, uh, data loading with this approach can now be done in the context and you simply just have to add defer uh, to the function definition uh, when you need it. Uh, you add a weight if you want to uh, await a deferrable. And, uh, and you know when you need to resolve a deferred value, you basically run uh, defer.run, and then you get back the, the real result. And then everything will be combined into uh, as efficiently as possible. And so the data loader itself, uh, there it, it already does like paraliz parallelization, it already does caching, and it also uh, batches as, as good as possible batches results. Uh, there might be some improvements that you can make, but that's just something that you can uh, add into uh, the data loader um, code, and then you don't really need to change uh, your uh, application code. So you can improve the data loader and get all these uh, benefits for free. Um, so can I use it now? <laughs> so I, I wanted to say we're using it in production, but I didn't get, get it in production yet. Uh, but uh, I'm planning to do this really soon. So we actually have uh, this problem that um, we have quite um, complex authorization. So we need a lot of uh, like uh, different data loading in different scenarios, depending on, uh, on the, yeah, the scenario basically to see if a user can see what he's looking for. And this is actually not possible using the, the, da the, the existing data loader. So this is the first thing where, where we use it. So now it's actually the queries are quite inefficient. Um, and, uh, and I'm really looking forward to using this. Uh, APIs uh, might change. Uh, so uh, it's pretty new. Um, um, I, I opened a pull request in, in data loader. So um, like the, the, the initial, like the eventual goal is I think it makes sense to have this in, that in the official data loader package because it, you know, uh, at least a solution to this problem, uh, I think a lot of people will have this. Um, so, um, so the goal is to have this within the data loader uh, package, but you can use it now. Uh, I've uh, re released like a separate package of uh, data loader that includes this and it's called lazy loader. Um, so you can just use this. Uh, and if there's any ideas on how to make this better or like feedback, 
I really looking, uh, you know, I'm really, uh, yeah. Uh, look at Hexel, Facebook's Hexel. Yeah. Make it better because they solve very similar problems. And that's in, uh, that's in Haskell. Haskell, but right? Some yeah. people yeah. posted it to, uh, port it to C Sharp, so you can probably port it to uh, yeah. um, Alexa as well. Yeah, I actually uh, had a quick look uh, at that as well. Um, yeah. Um, I think the idea is quite similar to data loader. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, maybe uh, maybe there are some improvements to be made. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, uh, you can uh, look this. Uh, so actually, all the code I had in the presentation is real code that you can run. Um, I published this on GitHub. So if you want to, you know, really see, uh, you know, the nuts and bolts and dive a bit, a little bit deeper, you can basically look at this repository and you can run it. Um, so yeah, if you're interested, have a look. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> any any questions? So basically, the await macro basically writes all your lazy loaders code. Like yeah. previously, you'd be writing callbacks. All yeah. it does just puts like it removes the callbacks. Yeah. So it uh, wraps the callbacks. It wraps the callbacks. Right? Yeah. So it's still doing the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm not sure. There's. Um, because it, it's quite dynam dynamic, so you can have, you're not sure if you get back at the first value or not. Okay. So there might be something you can do to, uh, if you have, can do like static analysis to actually not have the callbacks anymore. But okay. that's only, that's not in all cases. So it's still, you still need to have the callbacks. But it's still the callbacks, but you're just making it easy to yeah. understand. Yeah. yeah, it's basically syntax sugar to, okay, sure. to make it more readable. Yeah. Okay. It's like how they used to wrap like the Node.js callbacks when they're still doing Babel. Yeah. And they're doing yeah. Yeah. So it's basically a Babel plugin, <laughs> kind of like a Babel plugin. Okay, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Can you go back to the callback for the export in where exactly is the batching happening? Um. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Sorry. Um. Right. So what it will do? So this is, I think, the most important part. So it maps over all the friends' ideas. And it will create a deferrable, uh, and this will be a list. So it will be a list of deferred values, uh, and this list, um, with await, you pr you basically say, okay, create a callback. After this list, I want to run this, um, and uh, inside of the um, deferrable code, um, I still need you still need to run this. So you still need to call defer run, but then if it has a list of deferrables. It will basically use the data loader to uh, batch them together. Yeah. So. So just callback, callback, callback. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Why, sorry. Why can't you run them using Elixir's task and then join the result that comes out from the task? Um. Yeah, but then you still do the query. So if you can, you can do that. So that then they will be uh, paralyzed. So you will do the query at the same time. Uh, but it's still like five queries that you need to run. And so what we want to do is uh, do, like if you're using SQL, you do select uh, user uh, and then ideas in, in this like, list of ideas. It's a single query getting everything. Yeah, so it's a single, it becomes, it becomes a single query. Yeah. And especially if you have like deeper nesting uh, and, and a lot of like values in the list, um, that will just, uh, Instead of like 100 queries for a single uh, request, you only have like five or something like that. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, I know <laughs> I did some, uh, in my previous job, I did some experiments with uh, Neo4j. Um, yeah, it, that's, that's a way to traverse graphs as well. Uh, this is kind of more general purpose. Uh, so if you use GraphQL, normally, um, at least most people use, still use a relational database. Um, yeah. But uh, probably you can use the data, the data loader also for uh, Neo4j because a lot of times you still need to do some optimization how to execute queries. Yeah. I'm just trying to think out of the box uh, to prevent the multiple queries and the big yeah. queries thing. And Neo4j seems to be a good fit for this problem domain that you want to solve. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, deferrables are not really used in Elixir because uh, a lot of like problems that you have within Elixir, you can solve them using processes. But like this is slightly different, and uh, uh, yeah. Uh, have you ever used uh, Elixir 
the uh, batch size? Um, so it will be it will batch as much as possible right now. Um, so uh, gen generally, that's that's quite okay. But I mean, you can uh, basically what you can do with data loader. Data loader is also a generic interface, and uh, so they have a source for, for instance, Ecto. Um, but you can, if you need any uh, specific requirements, you can write your own source, and they can do any optimization that you might want to do. Um, so if like batch size is a problem, you can write a source that only does like a particular batch size. Yep. All right, okay. Uh, if there's not any more questions, uh, thank you. <laughs>